when women come together to campaign to right a wrong, sort out an evil, uh, as a group, uh, they are terrifying. And the four women I want to uh, talk to you about now were sound incredibly terrifying. They were part of an organisation called the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society. Now, it's probably the use of the word lady in the title there that makes it sound quite nice, doesn't it? Ladies. Oh, how lovely. Ladies. What could possibly go wrong if they all get together? Quite a lot. As lawmakers were going to find out. There are a lot of emancipation societies in the UK from the end of the 18th century onwards, I was about 1790s and onwards, and, and they have one thing that they are, they're all uh, fighting to emancipate, and that's, of course, they are emancipating the slaves. They are fighting the global evil of slavery. And this is remarkable because let's not forget that these women have no official voice. They have no vote. They have no legislators. They have no MPs. They cannot be heard in the courts. They cannot be heard in Parliament. But what they can do is they can make their influence known. They can begin to make their views known. And, and they start by, um, well, one of the ways that they do start, actually, is that they start to wear a badge. They start to sport uh, their uh, a physical manifestation of their allegiance to the cause. Josiah Wedgwood creates a badge. You've probably seen it. Am I not a, a slave but a brother? The man chains. And it's probably the very first logo ever created for a political campaign, incidentally. Later on, there's a women's version, am um, I not a slave but a sister, and women uh, start to wear this, 1790, 1800, they, they wear it on scarves, on shawls, badges, fans, Phew, must have looked amazing, reticules, love that word, and, and so they can identify each other in public, which is quite a bold statement to make, you know, women having opinions in public when women aren't even supposed to have brains, ah. women start to meet over tea, and discuss these issues. They're reading tracts, they are reading articles, they are exchanging ideas. They meet over tea. Tea is crucial to the emancipation movement, mainly because it is sugar uh, that they start their fight with. They want to abolish slavery one sugar bowl at a time. Slavery is manufactured, made, grown, produced by slave labour, and they start to make their feelings known, they start to boycott it. They are right to everyone, they influence the few men that can vote to make sure that their feelings are known on the matter of slavery. By 1820, 1840, as we know, the whole public opinion sphere has swung round, most of it anyway, to their point of view. Um, 18 and 1800s, early 1800s, Slavery is, of course, abolished in the UK, and by the 1840, the mighty British Empire has decided to outlaw it throughout its colonies and dominions. Of course, it takes longer uh, to outlaw overseas because a certain Viscount Dundas, of whom there's much controversy at the moment, uh, gets involved in the legislation. And in order to sweeten the pill for the slave owners, of course, they are, ma they are offered massive amounts of compensation. Uh, because they've lost the slave labour. No, the slaves don't get a penny at all. So by the 1840s, you can imagine these women sitting back and doing their crochet and uh, resting on the chaise long, thinking, well, you know, that's we've done that, that's good. But no, uh, the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society with these four women, Priscilla Bright McLaren, Eliza Wiggum, uh, Elizabeth Pease and Jane Smale, decide no, they turn their guns on American slavery. It's not enough for it to have been done in the empire, it must be done throughout the world. And again, I remind you, these women have no vote, they have no influence, but what they can do is they can speak, they can talk, they can write, and that's what they do. They organise, 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 they plan, they have campaigns, they build alliances and allegiances, they send money to America to help with uh, slaves who have escaped, who are setting up businesses or schools. They are, they are su suffragettes would understand this, they are deeds, not words. That's what they're all about. They build allegiances and alliances, particularly with people like Frederick Douglass, the, the great emancipator. Frederick Douglass, who was the ex-slave who became the magnificent orator, uh, owner of a newspaper, also the most photographed man in the 19th century. So they uh, build strong allegiances with, with the emancipation movements of the United States of America. They're part of the group that brings Frederick Douglass to the UK for a speaking tour. And if anybody looks at the dates of that speaking to her. It is exhausting. The man is basically on the road like Led Zeppelin. I mean, the heat is everywhere. And this is at a time when transport is not that great in the UK. I mean, there's no car. Nobody can just jump into a Winnebago and take you to your next, 
your next rock concert. It's a lot of effort to get there, but he covers the UK. He comes to Edinburgh, likes Edinburgh, by the way, writes a letter saying it's a very nice city. He has a very nice time and he stays at a hotel up on Nicholson Street. It's a temperance hotel. Shouldn't really surprise you. It's another thing the Ladies Emancipation Society was quite keen on. And he delivers talk after talk after talk, which has a huge influence, as they knew it would. And they're part of the, the group that makes sure that he's well known. Then something happens that's really quite surprising. And Frederick Douglass gets involved in this as well. Um, in 1843, the Church of Scotland splits and you have the Free Church of Scotland over there and you have the Church of Scotland over there. Now the Free Church of Scotland has no money. It has no income. The Church of Scotland does. It's got all the parishes and everything over there, but they don't have they don't have any. So what the Free Church does is it begins to accept money from the uh, cotton growers and cotton manufacturers, the slave owners of the southern states of America. And so the women, the Edinburgh uh, Ladies Emancipation Society and other emancipation societies, but these these four women are quite vociferous in in their campaign. They begin a campaign called Send back the money. It's to shame the Free Church of Scotland into refusing slave-tainted money. And again, they're ferocious. There are campaigns and letters, articles. Frederick Douglass mentions them as they're constantly pumping out words, words, words. And But they also come up with a, an amazing, we call it a stunt today. During one of the General Assemblies of the Free Church of Scotland here in Edinburgh, they plan and they do Climb Arthur's seat at night and carve the words, send back the money into the turf of Arthur's seat. So that if you're, ascend you're attending the assembly, you cannot fail but to see it. It is an astonishing achievement. And it's an astonishing achievement because I would ask you to think about these women for a moment. They're climbing up, and their friends, they're climbing up Arthur's seat to carve these words into the turf. They're not wearing jeans and Doc Martens. They're wearing dresses to the ground that get wet and sodden and wrap around your legs and yucky. And they're not wearing proper shoes that we would recognise to do the job. These are women who lift teaspoons, not trowels, but they are up there. And how, how do you, you don't have floodlights. How do you get enough light to do this? I mean, there's a moonlight, but it's still, it's quite dangerous for the time. How do you even go about making sure you're covering the right words in the middle of the night? I mean, you'll have to make sure you've got your S the right way around. Small practical details like that, but they did it and it had an impact. And it's a remarkable thing that they did. And then once the Civil War comes and America <laughs> abolishes slavery, you would think once again that these ladies retired to the chaise long and decided that the battle was over. But no, they they once again regroup and start the fire for the right for women to vote. And all of the campaigns that the suffragettes had owe a lot to groups, particularly like the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society, because they planted the seeds of influence, campaign, writing, exchanging views, deeds, not words, action. I think that the suffragette movement and even the campaigning movements of women today owe a lot to the lessons that were learned in the very, very early days by groups like the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society. And we should be exceptionally proud of those sisters all those years ago who decided, despite the fact they had no vote and no lawmakers and no voice in Parliament, that they were going to change the world. And that's what they did.